Thank you for joining us on our journey here to preserve the history of mixed martial arts. When I wanted to take on this project, I needed help. I brought in one of my favorite matchmakers, Miguel Iterate, and the MMA detective, Mike Davis. So to do this, we've been able to preserve history. Welcome and enjoy. Welcome back to the Lights Out Podcast. I'm Miguel Dorati and the MMA detective, Mike Davis, has joined me as usual. Chris Lytle, off in BKFC land. We're going to have to talk to him about this. But uh, we have been joined once again by the king of rock and rumble, Elvis Sinisic. We talked for hours last time and we didn't get through his whole career. So, uh, you know, we had to have him back and he was nice enough to join us again get this job done and uh if you like the first interview trust me i think we're getting into the meat and potatoes this time around mike take it away and elvis welcome aboard again yeah welcome Uh, to be back and uh uh, always a reminder it's good to be the king that's right king of rock and rumble baby all right so let's kind of just do a real brief recap you're fighting on the independent grind you get a last minute replacement against uh fight against frank shamrock you have a, a really good showing. Frank is considered the top fighter in the world at the time. You parlay it into a UFC stint against Jeremy Horn. Again, a, uh, a late replacement when Alex Dantas pulls off. And Jeremy Horn was in route to do a, uh, essentially they're building him to fight Tito Ortiz. They really had no idea and didn't even think for a second that you'd win that fight. Are we correct so far? I'm not going to comment on their behalf, but the perception was, yes, um, they were basically building up Jeremy because people had been talking about it um, a lot. That was the fight everyone wanted to happen. Everyone felt Jeremy had the skills to um, balance the, or counter skills for uh, Tito Waters. I had the good backstory because Frank had beaten both Jeremy uh, and Tito, he beat Jeremy by that knee bar, um, that Hail Mary knee bar uh, later on in the fight. And then he beat um, Tito Ortiz by ground and pound for the um, for the belt. So he had that history having beaten both of them. I went to decision, even though I lost to him, I was quite competitive. I had him in trouble a couple of times during the fight. Um, as I mentioned, uh, Frank, said to me after the fight that, you know, his job is to break people, that I should be proud that he couldn't break me, especially uh, on the short notice. So I kind of took that to heart. He also mentioned, um, I know I'm repeating what we did last time. But That's okay. Free free cap. Thing, he goes, you know, you should, if you get offered a fight with Jeremy Horn, you shouldn't take it because Jeremy is one of the most underrated fighters out there. He's one of the most skilled. Um, obviously, he's got a massive uh, career and record behind him, fought some of the best guys in the planet. And he just felt that if you beat Jeremy, you're not going to get the recognition you deserve for what value Jeremy brings. And if you lose to him, everyone's going to forget about you. So, you know, when I got offered that fight, I really didn't hesitate. I jumped onto it, even knowing what Frank said, because for me, um, that created more value to Jeremy because if uh, Frank had such a high opinion of him and, and the risk involved with fighting him, I felt that was a fight I wanted to take. Also, you know, I knew it was a number one contender match. I knew I was not the intended recipient to win the match, to get the title fight. But that's, you know, that's why I go in there. I like the challenge. I like pushing myself. I like fighting the best guys to bring out the best in myself. So, you know, when I got that opportunity, I, I jumped on it, took the fight. Um, as I said, it was very much last minute. It was about, uh, I think about two weeks, maybe 10 days. Um, most of my late notice fights were around that two week mark. Anyway, if you go back through the last podcast and review it, you'll, you'll get a kind of a feel for what I, uh, tend to throw myself into. So when I actually prepared for the fight, I literally prepared for a very specific strategy. I, I kind of knew what Jeremy was good at. I knew what I was good at. I knew I didn't have the time to go in fully prepared for a very comprehensive game plan. I knew that the longer the match went, the more dangerous Jeremy got. Um, Naturally, my cardio would be 
getting pushed. Um, I would then have to deal with a lot more different skills that he brings up. So when I fought him, my specific game plan was literally to kick on the outside, force him to punch on the inside. So I knew, even though he's got very good technical stand up, he's not a power striker. His kicking wasn't a forte, where kicking was one of my strengths. My boxing was pretty ordinary, but I knew I could uh, handle his boxing long enough to clinch up with him. And then the strategy was, strategy was there was just to pull guard and attack with submissions. And uh, as you know now, the victory 259 uh, in the first round submission triangle armbar, or as Danaher calls it, the dead elves. So, but let me let me let me ask you about some of the politics before the fight. This is UFC 30, which yes, is still correct. the Bob Meyerowitz era. So this was no, no. This was the very first show that Zufa came on board. So it was the very first show that uh, Dana White was running. It was the very first show that was um, under an athletic commission. It was under the New Jersey Athletic Commission. It was the first time they had drafted M official MMA rules and put them into play. Um, I believe Zufa had tried to get into Nevada, but Nevada wanted to see um, something happen before they kind of jumped in there. So they used uh, New Jersey as that kind of launch. You, you didn't see Bob Meyerowitz there, the old owner? Okay. If I did, I, I wouldn't have remembered. Like, um, okay. as I said, it was... I met like um, the Fatita brothers. I met um, Dana, got on really well with him, met a lot of his family, which were working behind the scenes. I met a lot of the admin stuff. I met um, obviously Joe, the matchmaker, finally in person. I met Josh Hedges, uh, the photographer. And I will point out that um, as I'm a, a hobby photographer, I had a photography business for a little while as well. I told Josh that he needed to get into Nikon. He convinced me that um, Canon was the his choice of camera. But years later, he would message me and go, I'm on Nikon now, or Nikon, as you guys call it over there. Mm -hmm. So I switched camera platform, and I just want everyone to know I'm the first one that suggested it to him. <laughs> and well, I'm okay with that. Let me, but wait, what, the, the final question I think is, is, so Joe Silva was officially the matchmaker and offered you the match. You had no interactions with Peretti. No, um, because I obviously I knew the history of it. I'd actually spoken to Peretti, um, well, not spoken, emailed with Peretti previously about getting into the UFC and getting over there. He kind of looked into it, uh, but the, the cost was prohibitive for where the UFC was at the time. And so he said, look, we'll keep you on record. And if an opportunity or something comes up or more money, blah, 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 uh, we'll get in touch with you. So that was pretty much my only interaction with Peretti. I was familiar with, obviously, the stuff he did with other organizations. I think it was EFC or um, was it the Extreme Fighting and that sort of stuff. I knew he'd uh, had that, his uh, commentating and how he was rather controversial about his commentating abilities. But... My dealings with this one were all Joe Silva, Dana White, um, and the Petita brothers. And I have to say, you know, the first event, they were absolutely fantastic. They treated me like family. Um, as I said, I actually spent the majority of my time when I wasn't training or fighting uh, in the, the office. So I got to know all the admin staff in there. I'd hang out and chat to them. I mean, that's how I got to know Josh, and I got to know Joe quite well, and I ended up meeting Joe's wife and uh, Dana's family and all, all that sort of thing, because I was a fan of the sport. Um, and so I was kind of excited to be there and I didn't really have, I had, you know, my, my coach with me. Um, and so when we weren't doing stuff, I was hanging out in there. Um, and I also knew that the office was where all the fighters would come in because they'd have to come in, sign their paperwork, sign the posters, collect things, drop things off. So I kind of like, oh, this is a great spot for me to be a fanboy and, and meet all these cool, uh, famous fighters. Okay, that makes sense. But Miguel, <laughs> if, if I may open up a little bit on this, we interviewed American Top Team owner Dan Lambert, and Dan had said he was the one that made the loan to Bob Myrowitz. If this is the first Atlantic City show, in order to make that event happen, thinking that he would have an opportunity to buy it or at least be in the conversation, and it was actually a tryout for the UFC. 
That's where this comes from. Okay. Your current, I should say UFC, uh, SEG, which is what, what uh, Dana was. There you go. Which is you follow that, Miguel? Zupa. Zupa. There you go. Zufa, what the fuck? There you go. SEG to Zufa. Thank you. Right. So you get Jeremy Horn, you get your hand raised, you end up uh, getting called back June 29, okay. 2000. Okay. Before we go into that for the next step, let me give you a little bit of insight. Sure. So um, after that fight, and um, I'm still glad, uh, as I mentioned last time, CT hasn't kicked in, so I still have these memories. So I want to get them uh, down before uh, they disappear. <laughs> we forget them. <laughs> well, after the fight, like, um, you know, obviously I was very elated. I'd achieved my goal. I'd gotten into the UFC. And I had to sit down with my coach. And we're like, you know, this is fantastic. Tito was just a monster. He just crushed Evan, slammed KO. I know it was a bit of controversy as to whether it was a headbutt that caused it. But the reality is it was a legitimate takedown and slam. Um, and my head clash may have caused it, but Tito's jumped on top, ground and pounded, won the match. He just did it in devastating fashion. And we both agreed, you know, Tito was at his peak. Like, he was a monster. Um, it was not a fight that we thought I should take anytime soon. We wanted to kind of build um, a career path, take on some easier fights or less known guys, you know, kind of build a record before kind of jumping in to the title And fight. it's your second fight on a contract, which means there's not a lot of money there. No. Um, so we've kind of jumped in, said that, flown back home, and then... Um, a couple of weeks after the fight. So this is where you're leading into my next fight. A couple of weeks into, into the fight. Oh, sorry. After the fight. A couple of weeks after the fight, I've kind of recovered. And um, I get a phone call. Once again, 4 a.m. in the morning or 3 a.m. or whatever time it was with the ridiculous time difference. Waking up and I'm like, oh, hello, who's this? And it's like, hey, it's Joe. I'm like, oh, hey, Joe. He goes, look, you've beaten the number one contender. We can't find anyone who's, who's willing or ready to take uh, the title fight with Tito. Will you do it? And I just went, yeah, sure. Just send me a message and I'll get back to you in the morning. And I went back to sleep. <laughs> Next morning, I've woken up. This time, I'm a little bit more aware. I'm like, it's not a dream, but I'll check my emails anyway when I get in. Get into work. Joe's confirmed the match. I'm like, okay, this is pretty cool. So I've called up my coach and I've gone, hey, Anthony, remember how we had that talk about career progression and taking the easier fights um, before we fight Tito? And he goes, yes. And I think he kind of knew. I go, well, I've decided that's not the option. We're going to be fighting Tito uh, at UFC um, 32. And he's like, okay, we'll get you ready. I'm like, okay, sweet. So this is Anthony I, Parash, correct? No, uh, Anthony Lange, who was my original uh, jiu-jitsu okay. coach. Okay. So, I, I got uh, one question Anthony, for you. Anthony Parash was a training partner at the time at Anthony Lange's. We were both under Anthony Lange. Okay. Before we leave that Atlantic City show, since you're a fan also, you know, it, it was a terrific card. Everything there was excellent. But there's one guy that to us is interesting there a real freak of nature, and he might have even been your uh, locker room mate because they might put the foreigners together. Was Mark Robinson on that card? Did you have any run-ins with that guy? Yeah, yeah. so um, I think I mentioned that last time. Mark Robinson, I met him at the ADCC in 98. And then, okay. again, I, so I met him there at the, the UFC as well. So, yeah, no, um, we got on quite well. We chatted a little bit. Um, and as I mentioned, one of his students – several years later would end up coming and training here with me and um uh, he was with, with the army he trained with us with, for a few years disappeared and then ended up coming back i think he got to his purple belt with me and he's now um being transferred again so 
yeah, no, I, I kind of, I met a Mark and uh, he was a really nice guy, but again, a man mountain, like the guy was an absolute monster, which is saying something because at that show, I also met like Mark Coleman, Mark Kerr and um, Kevin Randleman, and even though they weren't fighting, they were there uh, spectating. So uh, it was pretty awesome to meet the, the members of the Hammer House and obviously Mark Coleman, the father of Ground and Pound. Um, and when you say someone's a monster after meeting those guys, it tells you just how big Mark Robinson was. Wow. Okay, so let, let's let, let, let's kind of go back. Tito Ortiz, did you renegotiate your contract before you fight him? Initially, no. Uh, it just never occurred to me. Um, but then, <laughs> like, I, I kind of went back and then I kind of went, I ended up calling Joe Silver and I'm going, uh, hey, Joe, look, you know, um, you've given me, you know, this purse. Oh, sorry. I don't know if we renegotiated or it just went up automatically. There's already more. It was already like I got five thousand for the first one. This one was ten thousand dollars with the okay. five thousand dollar. So it still went up from the first fight. And then I've kind of gone back home and I've kind of thought about what I've done and I kind of end up going calling Joe and I said, Look, I want to take this seriously, Joe. Um, I wanna take like because I ended up going over uh, for UFC thirty one, where we did an in cage face off. Uh, with Tito, um, I actually got to meet him behind the scenes. Like I met him at the, the UFC 30 show, but I didn't have a lot of uh, interaction because I don't think anyone expected me to kind of win. I wasn't a real contender. So I kind of met him. He seemed quite nice at the first show. But at UFC 31, we had the in-ring appearance and we did photo shoots, obviously in preparation uh, for 32, where the title fight would be happening. Um, and I met him behind the scenes. And I have to say, one of the nicest guys um, out there. Um, I have to remind myself sometimes, he obviously has a fight persona. So, you know, he has a, a political, a, not a political, a, um, a persona that he pushes on social media, you know, to sell fights. Yeah, pro old, wrestling. Yeah. yeah, you know, the old adage, you know, it doesn't matter if people um, want to <clears> see you lose or whether they want to see you win, as long as they tune in to watch. And, you know, he did that very well. And he was um, just selling himself um, really well. Um, and, you know, he's the, the Huntington Beach bad boy. But behind the scenes, like, you know, down to earth, really nice guy. You know, we're stuffing around in the photo shoot. We're trying to face off. And, you know, he's trying to make me laugh. You know, trying to tickle my tickle me and um, put me off my game, faking, you know, coming in. So we act, it was actually a lot of fun. Like, I would really like to see if, you know, Josh or anyone ever got the photos of us mucking around. Um, because obviously the only photos I ever saw were the, the serious face-off ones. Um, but yeah, super, super nice guy. Um, but after flying back, I kind of realized what I was in what I was in for. And when I called Joe, I said, look, if you pay me an extra $5,000, I'm going to go on holiday. I'm going to take time off work because at the moment I'm working full time. So I've still got to support myself because this purse isn't going to. What were you doing? Uh, IT. I was an information <laughs> technology person. Um, one of my sticks that I kind of sold uh, in the UFC was world's toughest nerd. Um, because I was an active IT guy, like working in the industry, uh, working for, at the, at the time, one of the largest services or accounting firms in the world. I was with Coopers and Librand, which um, eventually became PricewaterhouseCoopers. So I said, look, if I'm going to take this seriously, I need to take time off from my work. And Joe's went, look, let me get back to you. Obviously, went and chatted to the bigwigs. I'm guessing 5000 wasn't that much. He came back and said, no problems. We've upped your purse for an extra 5000 Win bonus is still the same. And so I just went, sweet. They, I think they called it a training stipend. So it's I nice. time off work and I, I just I trained full time. One of the things I discovered is 
when you're training, like I remember um, Pedro saying that, you know, he trains eight hours a day and then listed nine hours of training. But when you actually really do train for most of the day, um, it is one of the most grueling activities. Like I was trying to schedule stuff and even with recovery sessions in between, um, doing it natural, like trying to do, I was trying to do striking technique. I was trying to do grappling technique, trying to do wrestling technique. I was trying to do cage work. I was doing strength and conditioning. I was trying to keep my weight down. Um, and so trying to trying to schedule all this sort of stuff in, um, you know, I started off with like about tr working, like trying to do six hours a day. The plan was six hours a day, six days a week. After the first week, I was dying. Like I had never trained at that level um, and doing it natural. There was no build up to it. I've literally gone from being a part-time person where I'm, you know, maybe training three or four times a week, you know, one or two hours at max a night to suddenly doing six hours a day, six days a week. And even with like doing, getting massages, going to doing ice baths, um, I was doing float tanks long before anyone even knew what sensory deprivation tanks were. I was kind of interested in, in that kind of recovery stuff it was killing me like I kind of kept it up for a couple of weeks but I had to end up adding an extra day of recovery in between I had to cut back sessions on some of the days so you know I went into the fight as prepared as I could have but I think I may have actually been overtrained um, just because I, I'd never done that before my body had never um Kind adjusted. Of adjusted. It never adjusted. Yeah. There was no, yeah, there was no gradual build up. It just woe to go. Um, an amazing experience. And it, it really made me realize the value of having good recovery along with your training. I think a lot of times, a lot of coaches can overlook um, good recovery. And again, if you have athletes that are doing other forms of recovery, um, <laughs> it, it, it can kind of, um, they, they, kind of miss what really is needed uh to kind of succeed so did you, did you ever think of using steroids at this time not at this time afterwards i did i actually what was your up, hesitation sorry what was your hesitation towards them i mean everybody up until this point that you were facing and they say frank shamrock was clean his entire career the people that tell me that i have no problem believing that, even though he looked like a specimen. Um, but I'd say a good 70% of your opponents were probably on it. Well, when I first got into fighting, it was, as I said, more about a personal challenge. Wasn't looking at a career in it. I, I was trying to be the most technical, the best I could be for who I was doing what I did. Sure. Um, you know, someone suggested I should get on steroids for the fight. And I'm like, no, I just want to, I want to go in and give my best as myself. And again, it was probably a little bit naive at the time. <laughs> um, uh, after the fight, I kind of, kind of considered it. I, um, obviously I was weighing up pros and cons. Um, obviously there was a lot of, you know, oh, you'll never have children, all this. And so I actually ended up going to a doctor and going, look, I'm going to do it regardless. Um, I want you to tell me the safest way to do it. I want you to tell me what the pros are, the cons are, the risks, um, the benefits, how we can cycle it and all this sort of stuff. And he was really good. He went through it all. And um, he said, obviously, I'm not going to prescribe it for you. But if you're going to do it, this is how we do it. I'm going to test you this often. We're going to be you know, checking these levels. He showed me how to inject by using an orange, um, explain dosing and that sort of stuff. And I kind of went back and I kind of thought about it and I went, look, it doesn't match my moral position. Um, it wasn't a career, so I wasn't willing to compromise. I was still at that point fighting for fun. So I wasn't willing to, to compromise. Um, my position as well as my future health and all that sort of stuff. 
you know, and obviously I wasn't as aware of things like TRT and um, GH and other ways that could be done, obviously, a lot better. Back then it was pretty much just your Decker and all that and your EPO and all that sort of stuff. So I ended up not doing it. Um, I did legitimately consider it and I got close. Um, but I decided, you know what, well, I'm just going to be me, go out as myself and give it my best. Now, as crazy as it sounds, though, you, you mentioned in there a big factor was the career stuff. On the UFC end, now, I know, you know, what happened in the ring may be a setback or whatever, but on the UFC end, things got to be looking good. I mean, you know, the Atlantic City show, like you said, they treated you great, like family and everything like that. This show is the Meadowlands. And that, at the, at, you know, if people don't understand that you got to be from New York. The Meadowlands is a sport complex where the Giants play, the Jets play, there's horse racing there, and they're in the 20,000 seat arena where, like, say, you know, Van Halen concerts and crap, you know, have been going on since the 80s and stuff. So this was a maybe the first 20,000 seat arena that Zufa had. A big and mess. It was, all, it was also like one of the biggest shows they did in, in, in regards to pyrotechnics and lights and um, all that. Like, it was amazing. This is one of the things I. I kind of did like that they took from pro wrestling was the the ramp, the walk to the cage, the big flashy <clears throat> entrances. I know they wanted to go, they ended up going more the boxing route to try and keep it more professional. But honestly, um, those pro wrestling entrances were amazing. And you go back and look at it and to experience it, I'm just so glad I got the opportunity. A lot of fighters and champions today will never get that uh, opportunity because the arena just goes off when these entrances happen. Did, did, did um, you have a adrenaline dump going through that? Oh, absolutely. It was it was su such a rush. Like, <laughs> and my, like obviously Tito had his flames and all sorts of stuff, like which was pretty impressive. I had fireworks, but they got me a, a, a giant throne. So the curtain's back. They put this throne. So I'm sitting on this throne. I've got, um, I had a, um, like a, a boxing robe made up, silk, black and gold with a hood on it. So I'm sitting on the, the throne, the hood down over my face. And the lights come up and I'm just sitting in this throne. No, all people see is this giant throne, black and gold robe sitting on there. I stood up, peeled, peeled it back, come up to the top of the stage, started shadow boxing the fireworks. I'm amazed I didn't catch on fire because it felt like the, the fireworks were literally right in my face. Fireworks are going off and the crowd just went insane. And... Then they had the big video montage go up. You know, obviously showed me in Sydney, showed my fight with Jeremy and all that sort of stuff. And I spoke to some people after and they said it was just absolutely like amazing. Like that video montage convinced a whole bunch of people that I was going to beat Tito. So it was, it was pretty cool. Sadly, oh. it was sadly the video montage and the entrance wasn't enough. Well, your fight with Tito, um, did it go as, as, was Tito's game plan as what you had prepared for? Was there any surprises on his end that you had, that he had uh, maybe pulled off? There were no um, technical, strategic or game plan surprises. Like we kind of knew what he was kind of coming in for. I'd actually done a lot of wrestling and my plan was to wrestle him a little bit to kind of um, catch him off guard. You know, obviously it was to strike on the outside, get him to come in. And then my goal was to kind of wrestle him a little bit, you know, get him thinking about the takedown before I initiated any sort of guard pull. If I, if I got the opportunity for a takedown, obviously I was going to go for it. The thing that surprised me the most was when I tied up with him, it really felt like I was re wrestling a brick shit house. And I, sorry for the language, but it, he was just like a wall. I've just tied up with him. 
And and obviously, it's not just how strong he is, it's his technique and his ability to control the clinch. But I just went, I'm not getting dropped on my head. And that's why uh, then I pulled guard. It wasn't the game plan at the time. It was to, like, the guard pulling was there as part of my strategy, but the plan was not to do it until later in the fight. Once he tied up with me at that point, I didn't even want to um, risk getting thrown or dumped because I knew he'd get to a, a dominant position. I'd have to fight back. So I just went, bugger it, I'm going to guard and started attacking from there. Um, considering how strong he was, I was surprised. I have a bad habit. I have a hard head. I can take um, a beating and I probably let that affect some of my fights as I tend to just walk forward. Um, not always the most strategic way that I fight. And when he was ground and pounding me on the ground, I'm like, oh, this is not so bad. I actually don't mind this. Obviously, it's not pleasant, but it doesn't bother me. I'm like, okay, cool. Um, and then obviously while we're grappling, at one point I think he tried to pass my guard almost went for a back take. He kind of realized he back stepped into back into the half guard and I think ended up <clears throat> going back into my full guard. And then he's obviously working from the guard, doing ground to pound. I'm kind of trying to work off the bottom. <clears throat> and again, this is where the problem was. I got a little bit complacent because his oh. ground to pound wasn't um, concerning me. I was probably a little bit relaxed lacks in controlling his posture before I'm attacking. And so he's come up and then just come over the top with his monster elbow. And up until that point, he was being quite measured. And when that elbow's landed, I've just, it's just taken the wind out. There was a big boof as I've kind of been hit. And obviously it was quite a, a solid elbow, it kind of rung rung my bell a little bit and I've gone, whoa, I need to get my act together. And then I've just felt the blood like starting to just, because he, he'd opened up like a, a cross up here on my forehead. And How many like, stitches did it, did it take to close that? Uh, I can't remember. I, I remember I ended up having to go to a plastic surgeon to get it done, not just a regular doctor um, because of the, I think it got stitched up initially just to the regular doctor. And he goes, look, you need to go see someone back home. And I ended up going, seeing the plastic so they could do finer stitching because it was that kind of X shape and kind of peeling up like the Xbox image. Um, it was a little bit, had to, had to do a little bit more precise uh, stitching and putting it together to make sure it closed up properly and didn't open up again. Uh, thankfully never did. All the other cuts happened to be new ones uh, later mm -hmm. on in my career. Um, but that that exhalation and the, the reaction I kind of gave getting hit actually triggered um, Tito and he started uh, ground and pounding. So oh, I'm getting hit. So I started kind of moving left and right, covering and kind of shaking my head to try and get the blood uh, out of my eyes um, and obviously trying to get my head back into the game. And so he's realized and he's just started unloading. And just as I kind of recover, I think I throw a, a left hook or something from the bottom, the referees kind of jumped in and stopped it. So I was kind of, <clears throat> yeah, it's kind of frustrating. I felt I could have kept going, but I also understand why um, it was stopped at the time. Uh, that was never, I never complained about it. I just kind of felt in the back of my head that um, I wasn't out of the game because a lot of those shots after the, the big one weren't landing cleanly or most of them were hitting my guard or rolling off with it. Um, but, you know, it's a fight game and it is what it, it is. is. What it is. I, I right. don't think it would have changed the result. It may have just extended a little bit because, you know, Tito was um, a beast, but I still felt I had the cardio to go the distance and at least pressure him um, a bit more. After that first round, I kind of had in my head my strategy was going to be to sit on the outside and work him and not give him the opportunity to clinch, but I never got the opportunity to test that out. 
So the rumor was when you were at the UFC office, you know, prior to this fight, you were in Dana's office. Did, did you answer his phone? Um, I answered one of the phones in the office. So as I said, I was hanging out um, in the office, um, you know, and I was helping out and stuff like that. And it's just at one point, I'm sitting in the, the office and it was an open office um, and everyone had gone. So I'm sitting there, this phone rings, 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 then it stops. Then it rings, 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 and then it stops. And then it rings again. I'm going, well, it must be important. So I grabbed a piece of paper, a pen, picked up the phone and go, uh, good afternoon, Zoo for Officers, um, headquarters to the UFC, the best sport on the planet. How can I help? And then I've kind of taken a message and I, someone's gone, oh, I'm calling for Dana. And I'm like, look, I'll take your message. I promise I'll get the message to you, to Dana. I can't guarantee that he's going to get back to you. It is very busy, extremely hectic here today. But be, be um, confident that he will get the message. So I took the message. And while I was on the phone, Dana's walked in. So, you know... And then I've hung up and went, look, thank you very much. Uh, and just remember, always support the UFC. It's the best sport in the world or something like that. I can't remember exactly, but, you know, and then I hung up and I went, oh, Dana, how are you? And I go, I've got a message for you. And he goes, what are you doing? I'm like, the phone was ringing. No one was here. He goes, it's not your job to answer the phone. I go, I'm part of the team. I'll do whatever is necessary to help uh, this sport succeed. <laughs> And he's gone, I appreciate it, but you don't need to answer the phone. And that was kind of it. <laughs> That's funny. That's funny. Now, so we got over first Atlantic City show, first show in the 20,000 seat arena. Now, yep. Tito's probably the first guy that dyed his hair, but he had like a LeBlanc look, which kind of is kind of natural. You walked into one of these UFCs, like with you may be the first pink hair or like shocking hair color ever in the UFC. I, I don't know what we're all about that, but I think you you got a, a bit on there. You're in there. Let me explain what was going on. So when I used to compete, um, one of my – a lot of athletes have, like, habits and things they do when they compete. Um, so I used to bleach my hair blonde. Right. So when I got into the UFC, Tito was already doing it. And I'm like – I can't do it. I'm going to look like I'm copying Tito. So even though I'd already been doing it for like jujitsu competitions and competitions in Australia, I'm like, I, I can't do it going into the UFC. So I just shaved my head for the first fight. Um, I think I did for the Tito fight. No, I think I had it short for the first one and then shaved for Tito. I, I can't remember, but I just basically did something different. Then um, we ended up, it was going to London for a brawl in the hall. So it was the first time in the Royal Albert Hall. And I wanted to do something different. So can't bleach it. So I went, actually, I tried to get green hair with gold lightning bolts. But my hairdresser was retarded. Apologies again for the language. I did a shocking lightning bolt. But I went in there with green and gold hair. Um, no one could work out what it was. And I'm like, it's supposed to be green hair with because Australian colours are green and gold. So that's why I chose the green and you know, representing Australia, wanted green and gold hair, and I thought the lightning bolts were cool, but the lightning bolts sucked. And so I had that weird green and gold hair. Um, later on I ended up fighting Sakara and I ended up um, because I have a tendency to walk into a lot of stuff, I tend to bleed a lot in my fights. I thought it would be a good idea to have fire engine red hair to hide the blood. I'm going to let you know now, it doesn't hide it. It actually just makes it look like you're bleeding a lot more than you really are. Um, <laughs> that um, and then later on with my forest fight, I actually ended up going the bleached uh, bleached hair with, and I kind of shaved it bleached. So, oh, yeah. Here. So that's a bit Before of a, all that. I did all that sort of colors and stuff. Cool. Your first UFC fight, uh, UFC, obviously a, 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 a championship contender with Jeremy Horn. Second fight, world champion Tito Ortiz. 
your third fight, future 185 pound champion, Evan Tanner. That's UFC 36, March 22nd, 2001. Um, obviously, Tanner, I think at this time, just switched to Team Quest. You moved from Texas. Um, that's correct. That's a, that's a lot to bite off. I mean, you've had three, two world champions, one title contender in your first three fights in the UFC. Yeah, no, look, I, I was actually looking forward to, to the Evan match just because um, he was so well-rounded. He was, I followed, you know, I'd watched him um, fight in Japan and stuff. I knew of his skill set. Um, I knew it was a different skill set. I thought it'd be a more exciting skill set to challenge myself against. Um, sadly, um, I got screwed over by... Uh, the doctor in this one, redheaded female doctor um, in the match. I didn't go in my into the fight in my best shape. There was a lot of personal stuff going on in the background, but irrelevant to that, I still felt I had um, what it took to kind of <clears throat> beat Evan given the opportunity and I, or at least give him a darn good fight. Um, and I had the, I got cut early in the fight because, you know, Evan does his slicing elbows and stuff. Um, Looked like it opened up the same cut that Tito no, hit you it, ended up being, it ended up being a new cut. It wasn't far from the old one, but it, I know it's one of the things I mentioned. I, the doctor did a really good job. That cut never opened up again, but I picked up a lot of new cuts during my <laughs> career. Um, and it's kind of frustrating because I did everything she asked to show that I was not hurt because I got cut. She comes in, I'm getting up. I'm, I'm just getting up. She's going, stay down, stay down. I'm like, I'm fine. She goes, no, no, I need to check you. So I lied down. Now I'm, I'm looking straight up into the lights. So my eyes are dilating because of the lights. And then she's checking me out and she get the eye pen out, checking my eyes, um, looking at the cut, and then she calls a fight. So I'm assuming that this cut is massive. Like, I just think I've got this huge cut on my head. I can't see it. I can't see clearly on the, on the monitors. So I'm kind of like, oh. Because I think she said she's stopping it for the cut because of all the blood. And I'm like, okay. Then I've gone out to the change rooms and then when I've got in the, the change rooms, I've looked at it. I'm going, this is a pathetic cut. Well, there's a lot of blood, but I'm like, the cut wasn't a big cut at all. Like it was like, you know, on the center is in the middle, you know, might have run into the eyes and stuff, but it wasn't, wasn't anything like the other one I'd gotten before or anything like that. I'd had wor way worse cuts and kept fighting. So I've, I've actually run out. I can't believe I did this to the commentators and going, what, what, what has the doctor said, you know, about the fight? I'm like, what's going on this cut? And I, I was kind of like, I'm like, well, who's the commission? Who do I speak to? You know, this fight shouldn't have been stopped. And, you know, she's saying it's a cut and the, the cut's fine. It's literally not, a, you don't even need a bandaid for it. And then I've gone to the commission and then they've gone, oh, look, we'll follow up with her, you know, because the cut doesn't look that bad. And then they've come back and they said, oh, she said you were concussed because your eyes weren't dilating. And I'm like, I was on my back looking at the, the lights. Of course, my eyes aren't going to dilate. You just made, I was fine. I was doing everything she asked, holding up, you know, when she was holding up her hands, telling her how many fingers. Um, and it just ended up not, nothing happened because of it, obviously. No. Um, it was one of the most uh, frustrating situations, I think. She panicked and I lost the fight because of it. Now, Did you go out drinking? Reason, I was going to say the reason for the panic is this is certainly, this is UFC 36, right? This is yes. certainly one of the first, if not the first, shows in Vegas. That's correct, yes. Yeah. That was that commission. That they, they were probably all kind of nervous about this new stuff going in. I mean, the Fertitas probably made them at ease in some ways and things, but all this is new to them there. And obviously here's somewhere, you know, where they may have jumped the gun on that. Uh, were, were there any other vibes from the commission that you got there? 
No, that was pretty much it. Like, as I said, I felt she did everything wrong. She never, she kind of stood at my head above me, looking down, never really came around, wasn't wearing gloves, um, didn't really check me properly, just kind of waved it off. Like, I mean, she goes, oh, how many fingers am I holding up? Blah, blah, blah. I looked at my eyes. Oh, that's it. I, I don't know. I just felt it was a little shorted. bit rough. Yeah, it felt shorted. Uh, well, did, yeah. did you go out drinking with Evan Tanner after this at all? Uh, I did go drinking. Uh, I didn't actually uh, ended up meeting up with Evan. I was trying to kind of find out where he was hanging out, but didn't really get that opportunity. <laughs> I really wanted to because, you know, I'd obviously heard a lot of good things. He was quite a philosopher. I found that interesting. And I, I was looking to have looking forward to having some chats with him um, under the influence, I think, would have been uh, a lot of fun. <laughs> now, you, did, uh, that, fight, that fight was at 205, right, obviously? Yes. Yeah. Do you think you so, would have made uh, weight in your career? So, yeah, look, the, the first fight with uh, Jeremy was at 200. The fight with Tito, if I I can't remember. I think the fight with Tito was the first time at 205, and that's when they made him, obviously created the new division for him. He, he made 200 before, but he, it was too hard for him, and they yeah, did create the division for him. Um, in hindsight, I probably could have made 185. I pretty much walked around at, um, in your numbers, it'd be around 210 to 215. So that was my responsible fiber. Okay. Yeah. And so I pretty much made 200, 205 just with a good hard training camp. I didn't have to really diet or watch too much what I ate or anything. Didn't have to cut. So if I'd actually, I think later on in my career, I had, um, I'm having a mental blank. I should know him. Um, well known dietitian that's worked with like, uh, Ronda and all those guys. Dol uh, Dolce Day? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, he reached out and said, look, if you ever want to make 185, I'd love to help you. I think you're a great fighter, a lot of skills. Um, Do you remember what he was going to charge you to help? Mm -hmm. I never got that far. So, mm -hmm. um, Did, wait, 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 wait. I'm not done with Mike Dolce questions. Was he like on speed when he was talking to you? You didn't really have, he'd ask you a question, but you didn't really have time to respond because he had more questions. No, this was uh, done by, I believe, email. Oh, so, lucky you. Yeah. Lucky you. <laughs> and I, I'm, I'm not 100%, but I think he was almost willing to do it um, free or discount. Like, it was that quite was a, at the beginning. Yeah, it was, that was at the beginning. He uh, yeah. he started to make, make his money. He, oh, he look, definitely... I'm sure he did. I'm not going to... I didn't have... You know, the email was really nice. I didn't have any... I only had positive experiences with him. Even when I've met him in, I'd met him in passing in person. It was always uh, positive. So it is yeah, what it is. Yeah, good for him. He, good he for made him. his career. He, he um, made a lot yeah, of money off I Probably, if I was fighting today, it would be most likely at 185 because even like, obviously I was bigger then. Uh, now I literally walk around at 205. That's pretty much my walk around rate back then. I was struggling even, uh, my goal was to get over 220 and during my fight career, I couldn't do it because I was training so much. Hmm. Well, Miguel, here, here's an interesting fact. UFC goes into London for the first time, UFC 38, you're obviously on the card, it's July 13, 2002. Although you fought Babalu that night, the main highlight of this card actually took place outside of the cage. And it's when Lee Murray beat up Tito Ortiz. Allegedly. Allegedly. Wow. Hold on. I got, I got one more Vegas question, though. I, I asked about the commission, but how about the Fertitas and Dana themselves? Now you're in Vegas. This is their town. You're not in Atlantic City anymore where they're, you know, beginning in the beginnings. Now, this, is, this sort of felt like a coming home, like they're hosting. Did you see any ostentatious signs or, or, or positive signs? Like, we're, we're talking about... If you're reviewing the progression here, Zufa was doing an amazing job at the very beginning, going from, you know, stepping stone to stepping stone. How did that feel that first time in Vegas? Oh, look, absolutely. Look, 
Um, they obviously had a plan and they were pushing forward. You could see it happening. They realized very early on, and I, I believe this is one of the big reasons um, I got brought back a lot into the UFC. Obviously, I have a hard head. Um, I, I don't fight to win. I fight to finish. And I'm either going to get finished or I'm going to finish the fight. That's just the way I fight. So, you know, they brought me back for that. But I'm also very well spoken. I understand the sport. I'm a fan of the sport. Um, I'm educated in it. And they realized very early on that I was um, a, a, an asset when dealing with the media. So they would actually send me off to do all the media stuff. Like remember when Carmen Electra came on board as the uh, ambassador for the sport, I used to go out with her. I used to have to correct some of the stuff that she would said, but they knew if they sent me out that I could deal and handle the press because um, they would obviously, a lot of fighters just want to fight. They're not the most educated, particularly back in the day. So the press would try and get them to say stuff to make the sport look barbaric and make everyone look like a bunch of thugs. And they knew that I would reverse that stereotype. So they used me a lot pretty much um, after the first UFC I was in, like kind of moving forward, or maybe, I can't remember if it was, I think from the Tito one onwards, they realized the value there and they used me a lot for media. Yeah. Like when I, during fight week, I would go to most of the radio interviews, TV interviews, newspaper interviews. Um, I was particularly used a lot um, in London because obviously it was the first time going into London. Um, it was in the Royal Albert Hall, which would never, ever hold a UFC event again, which was a pretty amazing um, experience. So, yeah, my, I, they were obviously paying attention to what the fighters, what value the fighters brought um, and what they needed to kind of help build and promote the sport. I, I definitely picked that vibe up, particularly... Um, in their use of me. Sadly, I didn't actually receive any further compensation <laughs> for those activities, um, which I believe nowadays some of the fighters do. Um, but I didn't mind. I enjoyed it. I love talking about the sport. And as I said, I have um, a very deep insight into it, you know, from a couple of different perspectives. So I, I enjoyed doing that. All right. Let, let's, let's talk about this London card. Um, what do you recall about the Tito Ortiz Lee Murray alleged fight? What, what did you hear while you were there? So I knew, so there obviously occurred in the after party. We we're all hanging out in a nightclub um, in London, and kind of everyone was leaving the party and everyone was outside. There was a little bit of tension going on. I actually missed the fight. I'm so, because I was with there, there with someone who knew London. And they're like, look, if we wait too much longer. It's going to be really hard to get a cab. Cabs, you know, in London at this time can get difficult. So they're like, follow me. And they kind of, we've kind of disappeared to try and go find a cab so we can get back to the hotel. And I believe I did it literally just before the, the confrontation happened. So I missed all the Was content. there tension building, you said? Yeah, yeah, yeah. there was definitely, you could feel tension. I just didn't think, like, I'm like, everyone here is a, a professional athlete. Nothing's going to happen. You could feel the tension. Oh, I'm used to that. Like, that's at every show. You know what I mean? There's always tension. Obviously, most of the tension is before the fights, not after the fights. But you still occasionally get a bit of tension between fighters after fights. Um, especially, you know, with fighters that fought and fighters that haven't. But nothing usually ever happened. So I, I honestly did not expect anything to escalate. As I said, particularly from my perspective, I looked at it as a professional. I don't fight because I hate people. I fight because I want to challenge myself, you know. And I, and I know a lot of the guys were doing it as careers and to, to, to further themselves. Obviously what was it like hanging out with Lee Murray? Sorry? What was it like hanging out with Lee Murray? 
let's say I, I didn't I like I met him in passing. I didn't really get to hang out with him much. Okay. In the in the nightclub, there are a couple of different groups and people are hanging out with people they know. I didn't um I really, you know, I went and said hi to every fighter in the venue, whether they fought on that card or not. Uh, I'm pretty easy going, so no one ever has any tension with me. So I, I had a ball just wandering around, getting drunk. And I, I was probably quite drunk by the end of it. I think most of the people were. Um, and that's kind of why I didn't think anything would happen. And I kind of into the back street, jumped into a cab and disappeared home and missed all the fun. Wow. But like the, 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 myself now. I was just going to ask, the nightclub, was it closed off, like only UFC people and staff, or was it London yeah, Blow? Because I London so. could be a rough town. I think it was um, a section of it. I can't remember if the whole club was closed off to us or if a section of it, but I definitely know we had our own area. Like most, okay. most of the time I've ever had, you know, done those fighter after parties, that we've always had our own area. Um, you know, they let fans in, but their fans are in a certain section sort of thing. Um, I've always, it was one of the things I did actually like was back in the day when the, there was only one after party. I actually really liked that because there's one after party, all the fighters afterwards, all the fans in one place. So the fans get a, a greater opportunity to meet more fighters. You know, as a fan and a fighter, I got more opportunities to hang out and meet other fighters. Um, once it became a thing to have your own venue, <clears throat> because obviously they were sponsoring you to try and get as many people there. Um, a lot of the after parties lost, in my opinion, a lot of the, the appeal. Because now it's just like, well, you know, I'm just going to go and hang out. Like, I think a couple of times, yeah, the problem, yeah. I, what I used to do was the equivalent of bar hopping. I'd do fighter party hopping. So I just wanted to, to meet yeah. the fighter. The yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, that, that, night, that night, your opponent was a 19 and 4 Baba Luce overall, another you know, world title contender. Um, you claim the UFC likes you, but they continue to give you just absolute savages. But at that time, there was only about five, four or five events a year. And that's really all that they had for people on the card. Like every fight was tough in the UFC at this point. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, and as I said, it never bothered me because I only ever wanted to fight the best. I just wanted that opportunity to, you know, to fight for the belt again. And Babalu was a great show. I think he won. Did he win the IFC against Jeremy Horn? He did. That's right. So he was, even though he wasn't a UFC world champion, he was the IFC world champion. So, you know, definitely a talented guy, very well-rounded, was known for his striking um, and his, you know, wrestling, and he was adding jiu-jitsu to his game. Um, so, yeah, it was a lot, a good fun fight. I went the, the whole three rounds. Um, you know, he won the decision. I had a couple of moments. I think early on, I think he realised um, the risk. I think I almost caught him in an arm bar or something early in the fight. Um, and after that, he played a much more conservative game on the ground, pretty much just kind of uh, ground and pounding, not looking to pass or anything like that. And just kind of worked his striking into his takedowns. And um, my goal was I just kept trying to um, <clears throat> submit him. I was kind of pre the days of, you know, cage walking or trying to get back up. Chuck was still kind of developing that game. It hadn't become mainstream. So I was happy to kind of work off my back. My goal was just keep it standing as long as I could um, because I felt confident with my striking. And then um, when it hit the game, play my guard game. So, um, as I said, a lot of fun. Didn't go my way. Um, and yeah. Babalu took the decision. Yeah. You, um, you take a year off after that. Oh, I think it was just – I never took any time off. I just fought when I could. So if there's any time off in my career, it's usually because there are no fights happening or okay. no offers coming through. So obviously it's, it wasn't what it is today where there are, you know, <clears throat> regular fights, you know, fights literally almost every month. There's only a couple of fights, you know, half a dozen fights a year. Not a lot of other promotions um, out there. New promotions kind of starting to build up, but not much happening. So I, I pretty much... 
during that 10 years, I, I nearly took every single fight that I was offered. Okay. Um, so it wasn't because I wasn't fighting. It's just the, the offers weren't coming in. You go to Pancras, uh, Kakuda, who's 23, 5, and 3, absolute savage. He's kind of, um, kind well, of the I, golden I was, boy over there. I, I was actually, uh, I think that was the 10th anniversary show. So once again, they brought me in uh, to book him up. <laughs> Um, I was particularly excited for this because he had previously been the ADCC under 88 kilogram champion. Um, so I really wanted to challenge myself with the, the ground game. Um, he was very well known for his arm triangle. I wanted to try my arm triangle escapes. Um, I almost let it get a little bit too deep. Uh, but thankfully, I got out of it, and I've got the little highlight now of me demonstrating my arm triangle uh, escapes. I almost took his back at one point, but he was a little bit slippery. I did a beautiful little roll. Um, I think I called it the suicide roll back in the day into a back take and then um, lost, lost the position. And, yeah, he ended up uh, taking home the decision. But it was a fun fight, and as I said, I was particularly excited for it because obviously he was the champion in Pancras. He was the golden boy there. He was the ADCC under 88 kilogram champ. Um, and um, Josh um, was over there as well. You know, I actually made really good friends with Josh Barnett. I should bring that up uh, back in UFC 30 because we both fought on the same card. He ended up losing to um, Andre Arlovsky, if I remember correctly. Um, and, but we, we struck up a friendship. He had a love for Australian muscle cars, particularly the Ford um, XA, XB Falcon, which was in Mad Max. So, you know, we, we've been friends ever since. Um, every time we catch up, it's always really good. So, but yeah, he, cool. he, helped, he helped me get that, that match uh, in Pancras on the 10th anniversary show there. Yeah, Kikuda was a legend because of the Abu Dhabi win. You got to remember, Ruben Asada went to Abu Dhabi. Kaoluno went to Abu Dhabi. Hayato Sakurai went to Abu Dhabi. They had the cream of their crop going there, and the guy that broke through and won a title, he beat Salo Ribeiro in the finals. Was yes, it was. Legit. Kikuda. So, you know, that is a feather in your cap just to get the fight, to be honest with you. I, I remember yeah. Kikuda, when he won the Abu Dhabi, obviously, you know, there's no real English there. It doesn't speak Arabic or anything. But and, and I was involved with paying them. And there was a Japanese manager there who will remain nameless, but he was a Japanese manager there who wanted to get in on the pay and maybe grab a percentage there. And Kikuda learned English like super fast. He was like, no, pay me, pay me. He <laughs> <laughs> wanted to be paid directly. So I, I remember him and definitely a guy that is a legend. Yeah, no, no. As I said, I was... I kind of was very much aware of what I was stepping into with that one. I knew it was to build him up and I was being brought in because I was an exciting fighter. Um, and again, they didn't feel I would beat him, and, but I would make him look good. I think they expected that he would finish me because his grappling was so good and I was known as a grappler. But um, thankfully, uh, my grappling held up and I was able to make it the distance. The event Pancreas World Series in Korea, July 17, 2004, it was canceled. Were you in the country when it was canceled or did you get a heads up prior? No, I wasn't in the country for that one. Okay. Okay. So September 3rd, 2004 is your next bout after that. And you fight a, uh, a very well-respected Roberto Travis, another ADCC vet. Yep. ADCC rep was a had fought in the UFC. So this was um, a new event that was opening up uh, in Australia called Warriors Realm. Yep. They were trying to kind of um, jump on, obviously, the UFC bandwagon, build a following in Australia. They, their cage was called the Hexagon. Um, I was obviously the Australian fighter they brought. Uh, but Roberto, Roberto had moved to Australia and was living in Queensland at that time had opened up an academy out there. Um, and once again, even though I was a legit, legitimate risk, um, I was brought in to lose to Roberto because, you know, he was the, the ADCC 
guy. He was um, had fought in the UFC. I was known um, as a grappler uh, primarily. Um, and the the owner, even though once I met him, we got on really well. He looked after me up there. Was one of Roberto's students, and that's how you know he got him into the show. And was it Shane? Uh, yes, yeah, Shane Barmer. Yeah, Shane Bomber. Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And um, I believe that was, I think, quite a few other guys like uh, Danny Higgins, Carl Noak, um, and a couple of other guys, I think, were training under him at the Well, time. he's a black belt under Alliance. Like, he, he, had, he had quite a resume. Yeah. Well, I'm trying – because I think that's when um, – I'm trying to remember because I know um, – the crocodile hunter was um, Steve Urban was training jiu-jitsu with some of those guys. I think they may have been training with him because I actually wanted to meet. I was a big fan of the crocodile hunter, and because we we're going up to the Sunshine Coast, which was the home for him, and that's where Australia Zoo was. And I actually organised to go to Australia Zoo after the event because so I wanted to go to the zoo and meet Steve. Um, and because he was training jiu-jitsu and was an MMA, was, had become a you know, jiu-jitsu MMA fan, I thought I'd be a great opportunity. Sadly, he ended up going bush um, after the fight, so I missed that one. But, yeah, uh, that was the, the fight up there. A lot of fun um, with uh, Roberto. And I'll leave you to see if you've got any questions about the fight. Yeah. yeah. You, you um, think Anthony Parash, a, a future business partner at this point, would you describe your relationship with him, another UFC uh, veteran? So uh, Anthony and I were training partners uh, under Anthony Lange. So we were at Machado Jiu-Jitsu Club. We were training partners. Um, we're about the same size. So we ended up becoming good friends, training together. Um, now, I'm trying to get the dates right. Round two. 2001, 2000, 2001, we took over um, a martial arts school together um, where we were training. The guy moved from Sydney to Melbourne. At first, it was meant to be just a holiday, and then it eventually became he's moving permanently. We were covering the classes, and then covering the classes came to, do you want to take over? So we took over the jiu-jitsu club. Um, it's around that end of 2000 sort of thing. Um, mid-2000 into 2001 and then 2002 we opened up one of the the first MMA gym in Sydney uh, uh, in uh, May 2002 we opened up the first you know full-time MMA gym uh, it was called Cinesic Perosh Martial Arts obviously a partnership between um, Anthony and I uh, we ran the business together we we're training partners I trained with he, trained, he was my training partner during my career. I was his training partner during his career. We kind of um, went from there. Okay. Now, on, hey, on, hey. This card, on this Warriors Realm card, uh, there are a couple other interesting Australian guys on there. One, one of those legendary bad boys, Ian Shaffer. What can you tell us about, about Mr. Shaffer? Yeah, um, I'd, I'd met Ian trying to think if the explosion I think the explosion event happened after that I think he fought on that um yeah really nice guy I still get on with him he was um he ended up fighting is it um Shudo um and K1 so you know very skilled striker I believe at the time training under Mick Spinks um he was fighting on the card um I didn't know him super well at the time but i was getting to know him and um all our interactions were pretty good and even you know nowadays you still get on well he's still based in Sydney, yeah, he, so he, really he, had quite, he had quite a reputation for street fighting i didn't so i didn't really experience any of that stuff i'd heard okay. you know, I, I knew a few of the guys back in the day um did that i think that's just what the sport brought in at the time so a lot of people <laughs> But you know, the one thing it did do is it kind of turned these guys into professionals and athletes because I know that um, Ian came from that sort of rough street fighting background and he transitioned into 
you know, a, a professional and an athlete and he kind of stopped fighting on the street. So, you know, for those people that say, you know, mixed martial arts creates more violent people, I think it actually channels them and stops them becoming from so, so violent. And, and the other guy that's interesting on that card, uh, another Australian that we can get your insight on is, is a big Jim York. I, oh, yeah. I like, I like the big heavyweight guy. I, I met him once, but he also dabbled in boxing or I think he fought Lucas Brown. Like Lucas Brown's a guy who was a, a boxing world champion. They got stripped of it for steroids, but he's Australian. So talk about that circle of people. Yeah, I knew big, I, I did. I'd met big John, uh, Jim York. I didn't know him very well. He was based in Queensland. Obviously I'm in Sydney. Um, I'd seen him fight a few times. I think um, the one of the events that I ended up commentating on um, IFC Global or something, I, I can't remember, it was in Sydney, but it was a massive event. It had like Murillo Bustamante, Paulo Filo, Josh Barnett, Carlos Newton. Um, and uh, I remember Big Jim fighting on that card as well. I remember, I think, uh, Big Jim fighting on one of the CFC events. Um, uh, I commented on, didn't deal with him much. Um, he, he always seemed like a very quiet guy. Wasn't wasn't um, brash or vocal at, at the events when I saw him. Um, obviously a hulking man. Um, I think they had a career plan for him to get him into the UFC. He kind of had the skills. It just, the momentum never really got there. I think he had a couple of tough fights and um, I'm not really sure what happened to him. And obviously... You know, Lucas Brown, um, I think he, oh, did big, I'm trying to remember, was it Big Jim York or Lucas Brown that fought um, Daniel Cormier when they came to Australia in CFC? Uh, that was Lucas Brown. Lucas Brown, yeah. So, yeah, I think Lucas started the MMA um, route and then ended up going to the, the boxing route. Obviously, he was, you know, a vocal guy, you know, um, Big, big heavyweight, tough guy. I, I think that that fight with Cormier made him realize um, striking might be his more preferred forte because I think the wrestling, he just got dumped several times. I think most people were shocked because when Cormier came in, obviously he looked a little tubby. He didn't look anywhere near like Lucas Brown looked the part, the big, big heavyweight. You know, they knew yeah, wrestling. Heavy hands, and then yeah, just Olympic wrestling. It was yeah, it kind of made us realize that there was something special with Cormier, and um, we'd be finding out in the near future uh, about sure. that. And we all know what happened in the end. Another little interesting, little interesting asterisk about Lucas Brown is he won a boxing world championship in Dagestan, and tested positive for steroids in Dagestan when he tested clean before he left Australia. So yeah, they, you know, there's a whole controversy there, but the guy that uh, he fought was clearly backed by uh, their president, Kadyrov, the same people that backs the wrestling guys and the guys that we see in UFC. So it is a small world unless you get out there. Huh? Well, yeah, I kind of heard about that because I think Lucas then did his own test after the fight to show that he was clean and he tried yeah i think he, he even he was claiming that something underhanded was going on <laughs> hey, yeah. in dagestan I, I, I've, I've kind of stayed away from that part of the world myself yeah. uh, you know, my one <laughs> point was not getting in pride even though the, the m1 events and some of the um russian events were quite exciting i was kind of happy not to head over there um, yeah, I'd heard a few stories where they keep tell you what's going to happen, and I'm like, glad I didn't have to deal with it. <laughs> We're going to fast forward just a little bit, Miguel. Um, you get back to UFC 55, October 7, 2005. Fresh off is the Ultimate Fighter season one stint for Griffin. Um, man, dude, another future world champion. It's, UFC's not giving you any breaks. Look, I, I think I pretty much uh, at that point developed that uh, reputation as a kind of gatekeeper, exciting fighter um, that was well-rounded, that would challenge people at 
wherever the match goes. Um, and I was, because I was exciting, I was good for building fighters up. I know I was brought in to build Forrest up. I actually ended up becoming good friends with him. Really super nice guy. I think everyone knows how nice Forrest is. He's one of the nicest guys <coughs> in the sport. And it's actually quite genuine. Um, and as I said, you know, we became, there was no animosity going into the fight. We just, both of us were in there to win, uh, to overcome the challenge, you know, and we made a bet that the, the winner would buy the loser a beer um, next time they were in town, which thankfully he um, kept his promise. And got, we, uh, got quite royally drunk, so. We, uh, we did an interview with him and Frank is cool, who was his early manager, really helped yeah. us with the inside information. And um, it's one of our favorite interviews. Just a hell of a nice guy. But we did like literally a two-hour interview with the guy. Um, they give you Alessio Sakara Sek uh, after that. Another guy that's tough as nails. And, um, you know, you're looking for a win. In an April and August 18, 2006, Explosion Sydney, you got Ray Matsumura as a promoter. That's I think right. he owns like, does he own like Five Rings Dojo? Is that the same guy? Yes, that, that's the guy who uh, I believe owned okay. Five Rings and he was running, um, um, the, the, I think the Explosion events were originally like kind of kickboxing, boxing events. Right. Um, and then he kind of branched into adding the MMA. They had uh, on that card, they had Nathan uh, Corbett on there, um, very well known Muay Thai guy. Um, Obviously, I think I believe Ian Schaefer fought on that card. Yeah. Um, James you know, Tahuna. Yeah, Tahuna. So there's a few big names uh, on there. So it was um, it was a pretty cool. It was like a pretty cool card and, and a great show to be on. Um, they brought over um, a Pride fighter because my goal was to get into Pride, and this guy, I believe at the time, had exactly the same record as me. Um, when we look well, here, let's let's set the table a little bit. It's Katsuhisa Fiji, just just so yeah, yeah, yeah. we're not using he and him, okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know that's right. And he was fighting in pride, and um, so this was one of the fights where I wasn't I was brought in to put on a show, like they it was you're finally the a side of a card, yeah. Um, so they gave me someone who literally matched my record. Um, I don't think Ray was particularly fussed who was going to win, but obviously they gave me a fight that was winnable. It wasn't, I wasn't being put in as, you know, the, the, um, the guy that's building up the underdog. I wasn't the underdog in this fight. Um, it was pretty even and, and it ended up being a great fight. I had a lot of fun in it. And I got to, um, display some of my jiu-jitsu and stuff. So, um, and won that one with a brutal armbar. So I think I nearly armbarred him earlier and he wouldn't tap. And I think when I went for this one, I really cranked it on because I knew he wasn't going to um, tap lightly. Yeah, you're back in the wind count, thank God. You know, thank God. I mean, you kind of got to shake... Uh... You know, you're passed off, and then you roll into December 9, 2006. We had mentioned um, nefarious activity, and you roll into Cage Rage with Mark Epstein. Both of the owners of Cage Rage and Mark Epstein kind of notorious with outside of the cage activity. I'd heard about that. Uh, I didn't experience any of it in the event. Um, at the event it itself, they, they treated me really well. Um, it was a very well-run event uh, in London. Um, as I said, I was, you know, excited uh, to fight in a different event, get back to London because I'd been there before. I knew I had a few fans over there. And look, I'll be honest, I was <clears throat> using it. So I told those told Cage Rage, like, you know, if I win this fight, I, you know, I want a shot at the title. But I'd also told the UFC, I said, look, you know, if I win this fight or if I win the belt, you know, I want to get back into um, the UFC. So, you know, I went out there pretty determined with this match. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to, I knew Mark was a very um, 
good strike. I wanted to strike with him to prove that I could stay standing with him. Um, but ultimately, the goal was uh, to submit him. And, you know, I think as long as the match lasted, I think two or three minutes, um, maybe went a little bit longer, a little bit less. Um, I was able to hang with him. Well, you got feet. cracked. You got cracked. Oh, yeah, I got cracked. Oh, yeah. No, no, no. I definitely got cracked. Um, but I'm all, I also know I've got, as I said, one of the problems is I have a head like a rock and I will keep moving forward regardless of getting cracked. Um, but once it hit the ground, he didn't even last 30 seconds and I was pretty uh, happy with that. Lee Murray was in his corner. There you go. I didn't, re I didn't realize that. Oh, I didn't remember that. I probably did at the time. I probably knew at the time. Um, but I'd forgotten uh, that that small uh, snippet. There you go. Inter well, and that adds a lot more to your uh, comments regarding the uh, the event and the promoters and the people involved. Wouldn't you like to have least money today? I did. Did you guys go out afterward? Did you hang out with the London Shoot Fighter crowd? They were kind of known as like the militant fighting systems of of like the UK. Uh, you know minus the groundwork, but their sparring sessions were legendary. Uh, no, I, as I said, I had, there were Aussies over there um, that I knew they ended up taking me out afterwards. Hmm. Yeah, it's interesting. Good idea. April, yeah, April 21st, 2007, UFC 70. They put you in with future world champion, Michael Bisbang. <laughs> and I, I 100% knew this was um <laughs> what it was i don't mean to laugh but it's like you're getting murderers bro it's like <laughs> and, and, and like he'd come off the ultimate fighter we had a big another guy and they'd already uh fought dennis kang and a, a few other big names uh coming up and obviously <clears throat> they were building him up towards um He's 12 and 0 a title run um yeah. So, you know, I knew what I was in for with this fight. Things didn't go to plan long before I got to London. So this is what I would call a clusterfuck of events. <laughs> so I got the fight and I'd, um, I had a partner I'd been seeing for quite a while. Um, and she had gone to, to London to live for a year. Because when we got together, she told me one of the things she wanted to do because she was of English heritage, wanted to go live in London. So we'd been dating for about a year. And then she ended up, you know, going overseas to see her brother and stuff. So she was in London at the moment. So when I got the flight, I'm like, oh, fantastic. I, I get to go fight Bisping. I go get to catch up uh, with my girlfriend, who I hadn't seen for six months. Oh, no, sorry, it's a bit less, probably about that three to three months or whatever. Um, and then early on in my fight camp, I tore my groin, like, badly. Okay. And I literally went to the doctor. They're like, you're just going to have to, you know, you can do rehab, but it's going to take time. It's a serious groin tear. I could not do any lateral movement. Walking was difficult. So literally for the eight-week camp, I did no grappling, oh. no sparring, no pad work. The only thing I could do was get on a cross trainer because I could lock my feet in a single plane and use my arms and legs. So literally all I did for that, for about, six and a half, seven weeks was run on the cross trainer because it, it had no lateral movement. It means that it was, I was able to strengthen the area without straining it too much. It was very uncomfortable for the first couple of weeks. And then it kind of got to the point where there was no pain, but I still had no strength laterally. And I just did that and literally... I had my first sparring session where I tore my groin. And then seven weeks later, just before I flew out, my last sparring sessions, I had one, two sparring sessions, one at the start of the camp, one at the end of the camp. 
I did pretty well. I was pretty happy with what I did. I did um, smashed out, um, you know, five rounds of hard sparring with new partners in. I, I felt I was in decent shape. I knew it was going to be a tough fight because I hadn't been able to do any technical preparation. I knew what his game plan was. I kind of, I knew he was going in with a knee injury and I was planning to work it. Um, and then the second thing happened. So Zufa had got on board a new travel agent and he wanted to impress the office by saving them lots of money. Ugh. So he ended up sending people on these stupid flights. So my flight to London, which should have been under 24 hours, went for 48 hours. Oh. So I ended up getting flown instead of directly to London. I ended up getting, if I'm trying to remember it correctly, I got flown to LA, to San Fran, to New York, to London, and then I ended up getting a bus down to Manchester. Did you so talk to anybody over at the office in regards to this? I brought it up, but once I got, I didn't, I didn't get the tickets until closer to like just before I was leaving. This they, this person ended up getting fired, but they, I wasn't the only person they stuffed up. I just happened to have the worst flight out of everyone because I was traveling the furthest. Yeah. And so well, the like, fact that they got fired doesn't help you at all. <laughs> he didn't have even get fired until after the event. But yeah, yeah my flight. I guarantee soon, that was the talk of the event. And, and the administrative side, stuff like this gets talked about all the time. Yeah. You know, it's usually when somebody misses a flight or they get screwed over. When it's something intentional like this, oh man, bro, that's not mm -hmm. good. So, yeah, so the flight took me 48 hours to get to London. I still had to get to Manchester. And because I got in earlier. I wanted to, so I was catching up with my partner and we were going to go down to London, uh, to Manchester together. And then when we tried to get the flights booked, there was problems with booking the flights. They couldn't book it for both of us or something. So we ended up having to book a bus ride, which ended up being an eight hour, or eight plus hour, eight or nine hour bus ride to Manchester. So by the time I got to Manchester, I was a wreck. Like, one... You must look like a down. drug addict. You may have to look like a drug uh, addict. Oh, yeah, yeah. When I got there, I was, like, horrendous. Uh, I was, like, oh, yeah. It, it was not a fun experience. And then, thankfully, I got there early enough. I, you know, I was able to recover during the week, get back into... Um, some semblance of shape. I was able to get some good workouts in. Um, I got to wait, thankfully, not too difficultly. I was a bit stressed because 48 hours of flying, I ended up carrying a lot of water weight, um, water retention just from the flight, from the time zones. Um, so I had a panic attack, but it actually resulted <laughs> in okay after a couple of days. <clears throat> and then um, the fight uh, just... I really felt I could have beaten him. Um, love Bisping. He's a great guy. We get on well now. Um, and he's one of those guys that has to hate his opponent before the fight. He was, you know, angry with me and in my face. And after the fight, he was like, you know, cool, bro. Uh, which was pretty... I mean, it is what it is. Uh, during the fight, I, I felt confident going in. I was working outside with my kicks and you kind of knew what, uh, how, how to pressure him. I felt he would be caught un, uh, off guard with my stand-up. I'd been working a lot of stand-up before, obviously, my training camp. Um, and um, I felt going into the fight that my best option was to keep it standing because I just had done no grappling at all in the camp. Well Elvis, you you had a deep Kimura in this fight, and it appeared that you had let it go. Okay, I'll, I'll get to this. So at the start of the fight, I was kicking him uh, in the knee, and he kind of catches my ankle off a low kick. Now, this is something that's pretty easy to pull my leg out, and he's just kind of giving it a little bit of a yank. 
and I've fallen over. At the time, I'm just kind of like, oh, I must have lost balance. I didn't really think much of it. And then he's jumped into my guard. And pretty much the first, after the, the striking exchanges, the first round was pretty much him in my guard, just unloading. Like he's known for volume punching, ground and pound. He's not a one-punch KO, but he will just push the pace. And uh, obviously- He's got I pretty good him. torque. He's got pretty good torque. Yeah, he's, yeah. he's tough. And, and I'm trying to work off my back and I'm having problems um, setting up my submissions or attacking, moving my hips. And at the time, I'm in my head, I'm like, shit, he's a lot better at shutting me down, my, shutting my hips and guard down than I expected. What I didn't realize until after the fight when the adrenaline had gone and I'd cooled down, when he caught my kick and pulled my leg, I retore my groin. Um, not as bad as it was the first time, but I'd read injured and that's why I was having difficulty working off my back. Okay. So in the second round, I've gone, all right, now I can't end up on my back. I've got to stay. I've got to either get on top or I've got to strike. So I went in striking, landed a big knee, dropped him, ended up in his guard, punched, passed, and I've locked in the Kimura. Um, I think if I'd done it today, I could have finished it. Like, Well, how deep? It looked like... Oh, it was deep. It was deep. But I also probably had his arm a little bit far out um, and it actually popped three times. And while it's popping, he's stretching his arm. And he actually told me after the fight, he goes, if it had been any other fight, I would have, I probably, I probably would have tapped. He goes, but I was in front of my hometown crowd. I think it was the first time his son was watching him. His family was there. He goes, I'm not going to tap. And he ended up, um, slipping out and then it looked I like you let it go well it started to like I could feel it was slipping and I did let it go because it had popped already three times I could feel I was going to lose it and I didn't want to lose the position so I used okay. it to transition to his back so I got onto his back and started attacking and a combination of the beating I took the first round, the trip out, uh, to the UK, the injury, the adrenaline dump I got from dropping him, I started getting like exhausted. My muscles started getting really heavy. Ugh. So I, I'm like, I'm work. I've got his back. I'm like, I've got him. I, I've just got to keep the back. I can finish him. And he's working, 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 and he. Manages to spin him. Oh, he goes off to the side, starts escaping the back. And in my head, I'm thinking to myself, left leg over, pose, pull up. I have to go to mount. But my body is literally not responding. <laughs> and he ends up spinning and getting on top. And I'm like, fuck. He's in my guard now. And I'm like, this is not where I wanted him. And he starts unloading. And I've got, I'm covering up and I'm just like, I'm tired. I'm just so tired. It's not, none of it's hurting me. And um, Mazzagardi's like going, you know, defend yourself, defend yourself. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'm fine. Just give me a sec. I'm literally like, I just, just give me a moment. And like, he's, he's telling me work, work, work. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, just let me catch my breath. And He's kind of stopped, jumped in and stopped it and then we've separated. And then, you know, I've kind of laid there for a few moments and I've got up and I'm like, oh, I feel better now. Mm. I wasn't hurt. Um, I just literally, everything had just kind of hit me at once and I was just exhausted. Um, I had no issues with the stoppage because I literally, as I said, the punches weren't bothering me, but... As we were told out the back, if you don't do anything, I know they're going to stop it. I knew what was coming. I just couldn't make myself do anything to keep moving. Well, Miguel, you know, oftentimes in, in, in these podcasts that we do, we try to pick out little things that are examples of who the fighter is. Like we, we do it in every, almost every single podcast. 
if I had to pick out one, it would be this fight. You know, at the end, the cut man's trying to stop your bleeding and he's wiping you down and you literally push him out of the way in order that you can stand next to Bisping for the hand raising ceremony. Like whatever issues that you were having physically paled in, conspir- paled in comparison to going through with what it is that you're supposed to do. And that, that, that's not an easy thing. Like some people, if they've got a way out of not having to stand there and have their hand not raised, they, they take that option. No, look, as I said, it's for me, it was always about a test of character, um, a yeah. test of personal strength. I didn't fight because I was angry. I fought because I wanted to challenge myself. You know, Bisping had beat me fair and square. Um, I, you know, and that was a, sounds funny, but that was a beating I earned and I was proud of. Like every time I fight, I never want to lose. Losing is not something, um, I enjoy, but I respect the beating I take and what I do in there. Um, and I respect what my opponent does to get there to win the fight. And, you know, he deserves that opportunity to stand next to me when his hands raised, you know, and I wanted to be able to thank him and congratulate him after the fight as well. So um, it's just, as you said, that's, that's who I am. Yeah. That's excellent. Um, you, would, you had a lot of firsts in your career. Like we've gone through about a dozen of them. And one of the first that you didn't get to participate in was February 20, 2010, UFC 110. It was the debut in Australia. Um, you were supposed to fight uh, a rematch with countryman Chris Aisman, and um, it didn't work out and you, you have not fought since. Yeah, look, that was um, probably one of the hardest decisions in my life. I was really looking forward to it. Obviously, I was the pioneer of Australian MMA, particularly in regards to the UFC. You know, I'd been with Zufa from the start. Um, It was their opportunity, their springboard into the Australian market. And um, I hadn't gotten a lot of the the accolades or the... um, Recognition. Recognition, exposure. Um, that, you know, the fighters did today. And this was an opportunity for Australians to, for me to stand up in front of my countrymen and say, hey, you know, I've been doing this, you know, for a while and I'm still here. So I was really fair excited fight. about the opportunity. It's a fair fight. <laughs> yep. So I was really excited. I, you know, I was at the press conference when they launched it in Australia. Um, I took this one seriously. It was the first... Well, this is actually a good a good point. It was um, most pretty much my entire career was um, all my training was done in Australia. Like there was a couple of times where I went overseas and trained, um, but for actual fighting camps, um, it was the first time I'd actually fought. Sorry, uh, didn't train entirely in Australia. So all my other camps, you know, everything was done in Australia. All my trainers, coaches. So this time I decided I wanted to um, do it properly. I ended up going to Tiger Muay Thai, training there for a couple of weeks. I really, the all I worked at Tiger was um, my Muay Thai, my striking, um, integrating my kicks and punches more effectively. I, I'd already brought it a long way, as you've probably seen in the fight with Forrest and, and that, and I was feeling very confident. Um, with my striking, I know Chris is not a striker. He's very much a grappler. I really wanted to pressure him on the feet. Um, that went fantastic, but it was also when I started, like I'd had shoulder problems prior, but nothing that had kind of kind of kept me from training more than you know taking a couple of days off here and there. Um, the first couple of weeks was like I was training twice a day. Um, I was not doing group classes. I was just doing privates, one-on-ones. Um, I was just getting the best Thai coaches they had at the camp uh, and working with them. I ended up picking up um, one, one coach guy named Master Yod and sticking with him for the, the majority of my, my camp in Thailand. Um, absolutely loved it. Trained like a beast. Was As I said, was training twice a day. Um, was doing 
strength and cardio in between um, and then every Sunday off. And I think on one of the Sundays off, I did a um, seminar for the, because one of the things, all they asked is they said, look, we'll give you free training. You just need to do a seminar. And I'm like, yeah, sure. I think I was one of the first fighters that um, did that uh, with Tiger Muay Thai over there. I don't think I was the first. I think, uh, I know Dave Manet, I think had been there beforehand. But I did, had a fantastic camp, but I noticed my shoulder was starting to ache and hurt. So, you know, I was going to sleep each night with a sore shoulder, waking up the next morning and it was okay. Then the next part of my camp, I actually went to um, Texas for about a week or two. Um, that was with my coach, Carlos Machado. Um, and that camp, that part of the camp was just entirely working on my jiu-jitsu. All I did the first two, three weeks was just Muay Thai. Next, about, about a week and a half, two weeks was just straight jiu-jitsu, sharpening up my grappling. And then the last two, three weeks, um, I went to um, Las Vegas and it was just only uh, or predominantly M MMA training. I did do some grappling classes and stuff uh, with Drysdale just because I hooked up with Forrest and he was training with Drysdale. So I you know, went and did some jiu-jitsu classes there as well. Um, I got to do a lot of sparring with Forrest and uh, a few of the guys, um, you know, Team Couture. I ended up um, heading over to, uh, I did a lot of training at, um, the, I think, the Tap Out Center. There was um, a few big Sean names. Tapkins? Yep, yep. I, I already knew, I'd met him previously. We were, we'd already gotten well, on well. So, yeah, I was doing training with him. He was doing some pads and uh, stuff with me. So, I, We'll, so I'll work some training. What, what happens? How come you fall off the cart? Honestly, I don't remember. I, I couldn't tell you. Um, I, I just remember we were, we were there on the card. We did a little bit of training together. Um, I met a few other guys that I was training with. Obviously, I did a lot of sparring with Forrest and his guys. I think I popped over to a place, because I knew Frank Mir as well, where Frank Mir was training, but he was prepping for his own thing. So he had like super heavyweights in with him. So I didn't actually get the opportunity to roll or train with him, but um, we were training together, like doing stuff, but he had his own guys that he was um, training with. So, yeah. And, you know, absolutely fantastic camp. Um, the only place I wanted to pop into Vandalay's place, um, which I didn't um, get an opportunity to during the camp a little bit disappointed in um but yeah it was, it was a great camp super tough um by the end of it i was not sleeping well just because my shoulder was hurting um so much but i still felt it was i could overcome the pain it was just pretty much in my head i'm like it's not a serious injury because i'm not feeling any sharp pain it's just more of a constant pain and, and at night, it's just a constant ache. And I seem to be able to use um, my arm. I didn't have any issues uh, with my arm doing it. So I'm like, you know what? Well, everyone goes into fights with injuries. It's not the first time I've gone in with uh, like the, the broken. Yeah, whatever. When I yeah. fought, um, oh, yeah, when I fought Jeremy, I, I don't think I mentioned it. I broke my finger um just before the fight and so when they do your they took photos for our um autograph cards and stuff like that and i couldn't because i couldn't close my hand i couldn't do one of these poses so i'm like i can't let them know i've got a broken finger so when i did the fight stance i put my hand kind of low and try to curl my wrist in so they wouldn't see the broken finger <laughs> but anyway so i'm used to going into fights with injuries how close to the event do you pull off? Sorry, do I? How close to the event do you pull off the card? I haven't. You never fought Chris Hazeman at UFC 110. Oh, sorry, sorry, for this fight. Sorry, yeah, yeah. So we basically got right until um, the week before the fight. And I had my last sparring session. I had um, uh, Igor. Igor Prokryats was there. Um, 
He was fighting on the card. Um, Prokop had been coming to our gym and training. So obviously the other Croatians, because I have a Croatian heritage and uh, Anthony, my, my um, business partner, had a Croatian heritage. So we had a lot of Croatian partners. I was actually doing a lot of sparring with Igor and I was very confident, like he's great stand up. I was holding my own against him. Obviously sparring is not fighting, but I was feeling confident kind of going in, even though I was in a lot of pain. And literally in the very last sparring session with like a minute, two minutes to go or something like that, we're just unloading on each other. You know, I think I'm up near against the cage and he's throwing down and something happens. I don't know if he hits my shoulder, but I get a sharp pain and my arm goes numb. Literally, I just can't move my arm. So I'm literally throwing and using my body weight, keep throwing. I didn't even stop the sparring session. Like I just kept, I, I wanted to finish the session, even though my arm wasn't working. I just thought maybe it was a dead arm or something like that. Um, and then, you know, the buzz is gone and then I've stopped. I've kind of collapsed in pain and I couldn't move my shoulder and it was, now I'm having sharp pain. So before, as I said, it was mostly just constant pain, aching pain. Now something's happened. Like it feels like something's definitely torn here. Um, so we've kind of gone, this was Saturday and then We've sat down. We said, look, we're not going to tell anyone. We're just going to ice it. I'm going to rest. We're going to see how it is on Sunday. Sunday night, we'll have a sit down. So I ended up having a sit down meeting with Eagle with them, with Anthony, with a few other people. And we're like, well, what are we going to do? Do I fight? Do I not fight? Um, and, you know, we want to, my arm was still like painful. I didn't, couldn't use it properly. Um, and we kind of went, I want to fight, but do I want to go out there and fight with one arm? Like, um, I, I don't even know if I would pass. In hindsight, I realized I probably would have passed the medical. I, you know, especially if you saw what happened on the weekend recently with um, TJ's shoulder, I think I would have got through the medical. But at the time, in my head was like, I don't even know if I'll get through the medical. Literally, I was having problems using my arm. Um, and then we kind of decided that it was best not to risk because we didn't know how bad the injury was. Um, so we ended up contacting the UFC the next day and said, look, I'm going to have to pull out. I'm really sorry. And they're like, well, what's happened? And then, you know, we, I explained what happened. They said, oh, look, you should have come and seen us earlier. You know, you could have, we could have sent you to a doctor in Vegas. And I'm like, it never really occurred to me. I never thought it would be this much of an issue. And it literally, so they, they sent me to a specialist and they go, yeah, it's pretty bad. We might be able to give you a um, cortisone shot to get rid of the pain. So we did that to see if that would help. The cortisone didn't work. Then they organized a laser guided cortisone shot. That didn't work. Um, and so I think we got up until only a couple of days before the event um, when, when I, I officially pulled out um, or I should say when the UFC have officially kind of pulled me from the event. Um, Joe kind of gave me a bit of a speech. He says, look, you know, I support whatever you do. He goes, but don't let this um, be a lifelong regret. I mean, I kind of knew I was only being brought in for this match. Um, yeah. if, I, if I, you know, if I, there was probably not going to be any other opportunities moving forward. And he kind of, without saying, he said it without saying it, he goes, you know, this is why you're brought in, you know, moving forward, there's not really a lot of matchup options for you. Um, especially, you know, I, I was coming off a loss of, um, on my last fight or whatever it was, or, um, it was this rematch which they kind of wanted to happen on the 110, which, which 
you know, first ever MMA event, official MMA event was our fight and then the first ever. Um, and he goes, you've got to balance up the regret of losing because you can't fight properly versus the regret of not fighting and missing the opportunity to fight. And he goes, I'll give you, he goes, I'll give you 24 hours to think about it. And my God, it was, I, it was backwards and forwards. And I was actually going to take, I convinced myself when I'd gone home that night that I was going to take the fight. And then I slept on my shoulder funny and I woke up the next morning literally in tears in so much pain. I'm like, I, I, I'm, I'm going to have to pull out. And it was, I still to this day have doubts whether I should have just gone out on my shield and fought um, anyway or whether it was best for you know, my shoulder's never been the same. Even now, I can't lift it past, you know. I'm supposed to be able to lift my arm up. It, it doesn't. I'm limited to, to how much. It still hurts. Um, even after surgery, I st it still aches most of the time. And I, you know, I train fine with it nowadays. Like, I'm like, sometimes I wonder, maybe I should have just gone out and did a TJ, go out in my shield. Because um, I know we kind of, Look, as a fighter, you believe in yourself so much that you think you can win regardless of what happens. And watching TJ, it kind of makes me realise that there probably wasn't going to be any doubt about the outcome. You know, you, we, you can't fight effectively with one arm at a, at a world-class level. So I have to say that this fight happening before this podcast has kind of made me realize that I probably did make the right decision. I don't doubt that in the future, I'm still going to question whether I made the right decision because the fighter in me still wonders whether I should have gone out there anyway. Um, but it is what it is and I accept it. Um, and I will say that UFC did look after me. Um, I, think, um, I still got my purse for fighting. Um, which was pretty cool. I really appreciate them doing it. I actually went to pick up Anthony's purse for his fight and they gave me an another one. I said, what's this? And they go, oh, it's your fight purse. And I'm like, no, no. I actually gave it back. I said, I didn't fight. I don't deserve this. And they go, no, no, they want you to have it. And I went, oh. And they go, look, they appreciate you, everything you, you did. That's for all the uh, favors. That's for all the favors you did them. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I, again, I really um, appreciate it. And I know they get a lot of shit, you know, because, you know, they run as a business and the decisions they make aren't always decisions that fighters or fans agree with. But I think deep down, look, definitely back in the day when it was, you know, um, the Fatitas and Dana, um, I think they had a, their, their heart was in the right place. As I said, you know, I... I I was disappointed in getting, believe it or not, I was actually disappointed I got that, that, that money. I couldn't turn it down because I, I needed it because I'd spent so much money on my camp um, to get there. Uh, most of the money pretty much would have just covered the cost of my camp anyway. Right. Um, so I, but regardless, um, I was a little disappointed in, in even taking it because I didn't fight and I didn't feel... I did what it did enough to deserve it, even though, you know, I do appreciate what they did. Yeah, no, I, I know you're, you know, what you're saying too, you know, you're a guy that, you know, you're at this point, you're, you're an older fighter. You, you got your health and, and things you get to think about, you know, TJ was in a different spot in his career, but I, I think the UFC was a little less than genuine saying, well, he didn't, you know, what did Dana say? He didn't look like he was injured. Is that really? Is that how we do this now nowadays? You know, so it's like, hey, you know, it's not. It should never be left up to you or the fighter. There should be an infrastructure around that recognizes that stuff. Look, look. To be fair, um, I have dealt with many a uh, commission doctor. Um, as I said, there are very few fights that I've not gone in injured to some degree. Um, some quite extreme, as I've ex explained. Um, and as a fighter, 
if we want to fight, we're going to hide it. Like as much as I understand, I understand entirely where Dana's coming from. He didn't look like he was injured. If the doctor didn't know uh, what was going on, it's it's very hard sometimes to know what the injury is and to and to pick it up, especially when the fighter themselves is actively hiding it because they want the fight, whether it's financial, whether it's a personal drive, whether whatever the reason is. If a fighter wants to fight, regardless of injury, he's going to do his best to get on there. And if that's the case, you can't knock the commission or the UFC for it happening because I've done it and I know that the, the doctors, they'll ask you, is there anything else? No. Nope. Are you fine? Yeah. Good to fight? Absolutely. And yeah. it's, just, it's, it's the nature. If you're a fighter... Um, I remember I was watching an ultimate, an episode, one of the ultimate fighters where they had the NFL players in there. I, 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 there was a couple of big um, NFL guys or whatever. Uh, and one of them was, he was talking, he was in, he'd finally gotten into the UFC after the event. And it's a pre-fight interview. I think it's a, pre and he goes, um, you're standing in the cage across from your opponent asking yourself why you're here and the referee looks at you goes are you ready and you want to scream no but I'm a professional so I say yes and we fight and I watched that and I went what the hell are you talking about when you're a fighter I'm standing across from my opponent and I literally said this going in, like even on the Bisping fight, are you ready? And I said, what are you waiting for? If you're a fighter, like if you have doubts, this is not the sport for you. If at any moment you doubt that you can win or that you should be there, you don't belong there. I'm not talking like um, in the change, in the change rooms, we all have butterflies. We all go through that, you know, why have I done this to myself? There are certain, you know, it's 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 the rush. But once you once I start walking out, I know why I'm there. I know why I want to be there. And there is nothing that's going to stop me from standing across and doing what I have to do. So to to, to even have that thought of questioning what's going on when you're standing across from your opponent means you shouldn't be there. Um, and that's why. I don't hold what happened to TJ against the commission or against the UFC because if he wants to be there, he's going to be there. Check out the full interview on iTunes, Spotify, and all major podcast platforms.